Highlander was released in theatres back in 1986 and it performed poorly, very poorly, but maybe this was due to the fact that no one knew what this movie was about. Even the original poster gave absolutely nothing away, it was just a picture of Christopher Lambert's face. Compare that to the poster that came later on and you can just tell that you were in for a treat. Now, although this movie didn't do well at the theatre, like I said, it did find the love it deserved when it hit VHS tape and it quickly became a beloved cult classic. The movie has spawned many other movies, TV shows, animated series and comic books. Highlander was directed by Russell Mulcahy, who at this point in his career was mostly known for directing music videos, including the very first music video to grace the screens of MTV, Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles as well as so many other music videos, and I do mean a lot. Working with artists such as Elton John, Kenny Loggins, Duran Duran, Billy Joel, Rod Stewart, Spandau Ballet, and many, many more. Russell Mulcahy had also directed a movie about a killer pig called Razorback, just before being offered the chance to direct Highlander, which was written by Gregory Wyden. Now, this movie should not have worked, but I'm so glad that it did, and this movie is definitely one of the best movies to come out of the 1980s. But it did have a few things going against it. For one, the lead, Christopher Lambert, who was a French actor, did not speak a word of English and he was cast as Conor MacLeod, who was a Scottish man. And then we have a born and bred Scotsman, Sean Connery, playing an Egyptian Spanish man with a Scottish accent. It just shouldn't have worked, but somehow they pulled it off and you just buy it. Well, not exactly, you just kind of accept it. You accept that this is what the movie is going with, so okay, let's go. Now, at this time in his career, Sean Connery was making the transition from playing James Bond for so many years. Bond. James Bond. And he was trying to find out where he fit as a co-star rather than a star of the actual movie. But make no mistake that Connery is amazing in this role. And I believe he is another element of the movie that is responsible for its success. He brings something very charming to the role with a comedic twist, but with a very serious tone as well. This would be the start of Connery slipping into some more iconic roles over the years, my favourites being Jim Malone from The Untouchables and Henry Jones Sr. from Indiana Jones. Originally, Sean Connery was approached to play the lead, but after reading the script, Sean Connery decided that he would rather play the part of Ramirez, which was definitely the right choice. Connery was only hired for a week's worth of filming, and if he was needed to finish scenes after his contract was up, they would have to pay him more money. So, on the last day of Connery's contract, with only 15 minutes left, Russell Mulcahy quickly had Connery make a few different poses, and filmed a few different expressions, and then made a small compilation so that he had some footage to work with if he needed it. And with mere minutes left, Russell Mulcahy called it a wrap, to Connery's slightly miffed amusement. But Connery did actually provide a voice monologue, the one that you can hear at the beginning of the movie, when his contract was up, and this was actually recorded in Spain in Connery's bathroom. That's why the audio may seem a little off, a little echoey. From the dawn of time we came, moving silently down through the centuries. But I think it actually adds to the charm of the movie and the mystique. And then we have Christopher Lambert who plays Connor McLeod, who was just fresh off playing Tarzan in Greystoke. Lambert said that the main reason he agreed to do this movie was because the story had heart and depth and was also impressed with the director's previous work and so he accepted the role. Unknown to the director and all involved, Lambert couldn't speak a word of English so on the set of Highlander he had a dialect coach basically telling him what to say and how to say it. Even Sean Connery stepped in from time to time to help him say certain words the right way. Now, when it comes to Christopher Lambert's performance and portrayal of Conor McLeod, I think it is very enjoyable to watch, and I think he is a very good actor, and he definitely has a screen presence. But I have heard in other reviews that people think that his acting is a little bit wooden, but I think this is mainly due to the way he delivers his lines, due to the fact that his accent is all over the place. But you could argue that a man who has lived for a hundred or so years would have a mix of accents, I suppose. So, even though Christopher Lambert may have struggled with his English, he has enough charisma and a certain look in his eyes that make you buy into this character. And I actually love his performance. I like it a lot. 
And then we have Clancy Brown who played the Kurgan who is absolutely menacing in this role and I mean truly menacing and terrifying which is a compliment to the amazing acting abilities from Clancy Brown who went on to star in movies such as The Shawshank Redemption as the imposing prison guard and becoming a voice actor in so many of my favourite animated TV shows such as Superman the Animated Series where he plays Lex Luthor and of course Mr Krabs in Spongebob. But for me, it's this casting as a Kurgan that really stands out as some of his most iconic work to this day. From the beginning of the movie when he plays a medieval madman to later in the movie in 1985's New York, where he is now taken on the persona of a punk madman. And according to Christopher Lambert, he also liked to stay in character when the cameras were not rolling, but luckily, he didn't kill anyone. And the Kurgan is evil through and through and it's just the way that Clancy Brown plays the character with this gravelly voice and the man himself is a massive guy with a bone structure that literally makes him look like death in human form. Originally Arnold Schwarzenegger was approached to play the part of the Kurgan but turned down the role because he didn't want to play another villain after the first Terminator movie. And after watching this film I wonder if the director was inspired by some shots in the Terminator because there are a few scenes featuring the Kurgan that give me Terminator vibes. There's even similar music in the background. And speaking of music, another reason I think this movie works so well is because of the music performed by Queen. And I've got to say, if it was not for these songs, I honestly do not think this movie would have had the same impact. The inclusion of Queen really did add something very powerful to this movie. Originally, the band were only asked to write one song for this movie, but after being shown 20 minutes worth of footage, the band members went about writing more songs because they were just so impressed by what they had watched. These songs included Princes of the Universe, which opens the movie in such an energetic way, and of course, it's a kind of magic. And then we have the heartbreaking track, Who Wants to Live Forever, which plays over the scene where Heather, McLeod's wife, grows old and dies whilst he remains the same age, and the music just adds more emotion to this scene. The music by Queen adds so much more to this movie, it makes it stronger in a way that I really can't imagine any other band could have pulled off. This movie also boasts some very unique filming techniques to get the perfect shot. At the start of the movie, the camera seems to actually fly around the wrestling stadium. As though the camera is attached to a helicopter, there's even the sound of rotor blades in the background. And I remember wondering when I first watched this movie, how did they achieve this shot? This was the 1980s, I don't think drones were in operation back then. They actually achieved this shot by using a rig called a Skycam, which is where you would attach wires in four corners of the stadium and then control the camera which is attached to those wires by computer, capturing some really flawless shots with a few cool transitions before they switched to a different camera shot. And the way they got these transitions were quite clever actually, because you see the wrestling match was actually an actual live wrestling match, and all the people in the audience were snapping pictures. So what they did when they saw a flash of the camera, they put in a white screen, which sent them perfectly into the next transition of the next shot. It was really, really well done. Now originally this opening scene at the wrestling match was supposed to take place at a hockey match and the clashing of hockey sticks was supposed to remind McLeod of the clashing of swords before we had that transition that takes us back in time to McLeod's first battle in Scotland. But for some reason they were not allowed to film at the hockey stadium so they settled on a wrestling match and on paper the hockey stadium was the better idea but regardless the director made the wrestling match idea work. Russell Mulcahy, in my opinion, is a very, very good director and an excellent choice to direct this movie. And his editing seems to be very, very fast paced, cutting quickly from one image to the next, constantly keeping you on your toes and keeping you engaged with the movie. And he isn't afraid to go the extra mile to get a good shot, even if that means gluing some anklers to a deer's head to get the shot he wants. And yes, that did actually happen in this movie. But there were some shots in this movie that looked great, but were totally on accident. There's a certain shot involving the Kurgan in a flashback scene on the battlefield of Scotland, and you see a dark shadow or cloud fall over the Kurgan as the camera lowers from above him. It's the perfect shot that really brings home that this guy is evil and bad as the darkness engulfs him. But it wasn't actually meant to happen that way. The shot was actually an accident, and the shadow was created by the arm of the camera rig. Which looked so good that the director decided not to do a second shot and to actually leave it in the movie. 
Also, during the scene upon the battlefield, the Scottish extras who were involved in the fight scenes had all become very drunk trying to keep themselves warm. And as a result, a lot of the men actually injured themselves for real, as they probably got a little too keen reenacting the battle. But it's safe to say they were all having a really, really good time. Now, the movie tells a story over many different periods in time, but the movie isn't linear with the passage of time, and the movie constantly switches from scene to scene, from the past to the present, but it isn't confusing, and that is because Russell Mulcahy included these transitions that take us perfectly from the past to the present and from the present to the past. One of my favourites being a transition shot from inside a fish tank in the modern day and then submerging from a Scottish lake in the 16th century. It is truly flawless editing. Especially when you consider this is from the era of practical filmmaking, it is very, very, very impressive. And it's not the only flawless transition in this movie. Highlander is actually well known for its imaginative transitions and it's kind of become famous for them over the years. Now, there's a fight scene between McLeod and a fellow immortal in a parking lot which is supposed to be below Madison Square Gardens where the wrestling match took place. But in fact, it is filmed in a parking lot in London. To make the car park actually look American, they actually brought in a lot of American cars, which later they would just destroy in the scene. This scene is very, very fast paced with some tension mixed in as well, as the two duel with their swords and sparks fly from their blades as they clash. And this was actually achieved by connecting the swords to car batteries that were placed at the actor's feet, where they wouldn't be seen in the shot which would make the swords too hot to handle after a short period of time. Now, apparently they were having trouble in this scene with lighting. They didn't know how to actually light it to get the most effective shot. That is when Russell McKay, he suggested that they just turn out the lights and make the lights of the car park flicker. Something that was, for some reason, unheard of at the time in filmmaking, but Russell McKay, he ensured the, uh, the, the, the guy who was in charge of the lighting that this would work and lo and behold it did and it created a really atmospheric scene and he actually added to this creativity by setting off the sprinklers as well which made it literally rain inside the parking lot which didn't really make that much sense that's what the director actually said himself but it was a great combination that worked for the movie. Now, I think this is an absolutely brilliant opening scene to the movie. It's a brilliant action set piece. And as much as I absolutely love this scene, I must admit, the constant backflips performed by McLeod's opponent make it a little bit comical and a little bit ridiculous. But at the same time, I can't help but love it. It's just one of those films where you kind of lean into the ridiculousness of it all. And by doing that, the movie just works as a whole, if that makes sense. It is quite a well-constructed fight scene that is both tense and exciting, and when McLeod actually takes his opponent's head, we are treated to some practical effects mixed with some visual effects as well. As hubcaps are blown from the cars and the windshields explode outwards, it really is visually very, very appealing and McLeod is rewarded with the quickening. Now, imagine seeing this for the very, very first time and wondering what the heck is going on in this movie. Another brilliant scene is where Sean Connery's character Ramirez and Clancy Brown's character the Kurgan have an intense sword fight at McLeod's home back in the 16th century. It was in this scene that Sean Connery was almost injured by a piece of the Kurgan sword which went flying past his head. Now, originally Clancy Brown was supposed to come through the door and then hit the table in two with his sword, and that is a scene you actually see in the movie. But originally, he came crashing through the door, and because he was so nervous, he swung his sword the wrong way and sent a candlestick flying across the room, and a bit of his sword broke off, and just went past Sean Connery's head, missing him. Now, apparently Sean Connery was not happy about this, and he stormed off set. And, as you can imagine, Clancy Brown was a little bit upset about this, and embarrassed. But eventually Sean Connery did return and he made light of the situation and all was good again and they reshot the scene and they got it right this time as you can see in the movie. Now in this scene there is a mixture of practical and visual effects which includes the castle wall coming down as swords clash leaving the two fighting on a crumbling staircase which is most definitely practical effects with only a few lightning animations here and there and a wind machine maybe. And in my opinion, I think this scene is incredible. Sean Connery is on form in the scene and Clancy Brown brings a lot of menace. 
Now, as much as I do love this movie, it does have its flaws. And when I say flaws, I mean very, very minor ones. One element of the story that never quite felt right to me is the romance that comes later on in the movie between Connor and a character named Brenda, who is a forensic scientist played by Roxanne Hart. Here is the issue I have with this romance. Brenda suspects Connor or Russell Nash of being a murderer. And at one point, Connor starts to actually follow Brenda around and you get this kind of creepy stalker vibe from him. Um, she suspects him of being a murderer, she doesn't trust him in the slightest, there's no trust between her and Connor at all, until she finds out that he is immortal. And he stabs himself to prove this point, and then when he heals, they simply just start to, you know, do it. And I don't know, maybe you disagree with me on this, but this love scene that we get, and this relationship between Connor and Brenda actually feels like it's disconnected from the movie in some ways. Like it's kind of forced upon us. Now compare this romance between Connor and Brenda to the romance between Connor and Heather back in Scotland in the past and there is simply no comparison. Those scenes were necessary for the story and it held weight and meaning. And those scenes were quite emotional and really really sad as Heather passed away in Connor's arms as he remained the same age and then went on to live without her. The romance that comes later on in the movie between Connor and Brenda always seemed to be just a little bit forced upon us. But I must admit, and I'm going to contradict myself now, to actually give Connor a love interest for the end of the movie, after he has won the prize and he has become mortal, was a great way to bring his loneliness to an end and give a happy ending to Connor. So I kind of have split feelings about what I'm actually saying here, if I'm being totally honest. Now, before I end today's episode, I want to talk about one of my favourite scenes in the entire movie, and that is the fight between the Kurgan and Connor right at the end of the movie. The fight starts on a rooftop below the Silver Cup studio sign, and they actually built a much smaller replica of this sign that was built to collapse. But they also shot certain scenes on the actual sign, mainly the scenes where you can see the city in the background. Those are the scenes on the actual Silver Cup sign. But then when you see the sign from front on, that is the actual replica of the sign, which like I said is built much smaller. But because of the way it was shot, you kind of don't notice unless it's pointed out to you. This scene also featured a water tank that spills water all over the rooftop. And this scene is visually amazing with the sparks of electricity coming down onto the water and it's kind of reflecting all these sparks as well as the sign collapses all around them. And like I said, this was in the days of practical effects. So this sequence had to be planned to perfection so not to electrocute any of the actors. McLeod and the Kurgan then fall through a skylight on the roof into a big warehouse area. And this is where they have the grand finale, the big fight scene. And it's this scene inside the warehouse that I really, really wanted to talk about. This fight scene is spectacular with some of those swooping camera shots that I mentioned earlier. And the way the windows in the background are lit up is visually amazing. And you can definitely see Russell Mulcahy's background in music videos when you look at this. It looks like a shot directly out of a music video. The way this scene is lit is visually satisfying and it's utilised to get some very cool silhouette shots of McLeod and the Kurgan just swinging away at each other and it looks really, really cool. And then we get one of my favourite lines in the entire movie and it isn't what you think. It's when the Kurgan knocks Connor to the floor and he's about to take his final swing. Brenda hits the Kurgan with a pipe distracting him and then the Kurgan goes to cut Brenda in two. And as the Kurgan sword comes down, it's blocked just in time by Connor's sword, who has managed to get back on his feet and get back into the fight. And then he delivers this line. <laughs> what kept you? And I just absolutely love this scene. It makes me laugh every single time. It is, yes, cheesy, but it's awesome. And this is what I was talking about earlier with Christopher Lambert's timing when it comes to setting up a joke or setting up something amusing, he does it perfectly. And it feels like the start of a build-up as the music kicks in just before Connor takes the Kurgan's head. And then the camera does another impressive sweep and zooms in on Connor's face as he delivers the line. There can be only one. There Can Be Only One is now a line that has become firmly associated not just with this movie but the entire franchise. It always comes up and I believe that this line 
has become just as famous as I'll be back or make my day. It really is a line that is up there with the rest. Connor receives his prize as a quickening delivers all the power to him. And to achieve the shot, they actually blew out every single window, sending shards of glass everywhere, which is a very cool shot, and it's done with all practical effects. And then we see the animated demon-like creature circling McLeod and passing through his body as he levitates up in the air with some very obvious wire shots which they left in the film. This was back in the day before digital, like, erasing. So the wires are still clearly there and it's a mistake that you cannot help but notice every single time you watch this movie but it's also a mistake that I enjoy noticing if that makes sense. As it reminds me of the many practical effects that were utilised in this movie and for most they pulled them off really well. And there have been many other sequels and spin-offs over the years but in my opinion there can be only one. Until next time take care of yourselves and each other and I will see you very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> what kept you?